thing. This interview is being conducted with William C. Bill Thrash interviewing for the Oklahoma Historical Society is Roger Harris. The date is January 4, 1991, and the location of the interview is at the Oklahoma Educational Television Authority. Mr. Thrash, where were you born? Ada, Oklahoma. And you were educated in the public school system there? Yes. And then where did you attend college? There in Ada at East Central University. Did you go into broadcasting right out of school? Well, I actually started in broadcasting at the television station K-10, K-T-E-N. It was unique that in a, Ada, Oklahoma, a town of that size, to have a full power VHF television station. It was one of the smallest markets in America, especially in 1954 when it went on the air. In the summer of 1955, while I was still in high school, <clears throat> I went to work there during the summer uh, on a full-time basis in the television production department, learning to run camera and lighting and uh, boom operation and all those things that you did then. <clears throat> and immediately uh, decided that that's how I wanted to spend my career in broadcasting. Uh, I'd been interested in radio a little bit up until that, but when television signed on, and at that time WKY Television in Oklahoma City uh, was had been on the air five years, uh, and so this was the really kind of the second television station to see. I knew then that's what I wanted to do. So I worked in the summers, uh, during high school and uh, when I graduated from high school I went full-time working at the television station in production and programming and traffic and promotion and uh, all of those areas and because of that I decided to stay at East Central in Ada and get a general uh, degree in at in college rather than go away to a broadcast school because I found that I was doing the real thing by working at K-10 and that was uh, probably the best education I had because in a small television operation like that uh, affiliated with the networks as we were and having news departments and local programming and commercial production I was doing the real thing rather than play like and so uh, worked uh, full-time, meaning six days a week, 48 hours a week. Uh, that's what we call full-time in those days. And uh, going to college full-time. So a typical schedule for four years, would, I attended college from 8 a.m. to 12 noon and uh, then worked at uh, K-10 from uh, 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, six nights a week. And uh, that's where I got my start in television. Now, was <clears throat> what were some of the jobs specifically that you did at K-10? Specifically, starting with camera operation, um, lighting, uh, studio work, moving into directing live shows, and live shows then were plentiful because videotape did not come onto the scene until 1958. The first videotape machine purchased in the state of Oklahoma was WKY TV in 1958. The second videotape machine was purchased that same year by K-10 in Ada. We had 30 employees at K-10 at that time, 1958-59, and the uh, management, Bill Hoover specifically, purchased an Ampex videotape machine, same model, Channel 4 bought that same year, 
uh, he purchased that tape machine and immediately fired 15 employees. We went from 30 employees to 15 to pay for it. It changed the way we did television. We stopped doing the live shows and the live commercials and put them on tape all at once and then you didn't have to have those people sitting around and standing around waiting on 9.22 p.m. to come around, which is when the live commercial took place. We put it on tape at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and then that tape ran uh, rather than doing it live. We might have a Culver's Dairy milk commercial where we take a close-up of hand pouring a carton of milk into a glass. We would do that spot 15 times a week, three times a night or whatever. And when videotape came along, we taped it once and ran the tape over and over. So that's, that was a major change in the way television stations operate. Of course, the next problem was when you owned one of those tape machines, you immediately discovered that you needed to have two. And after you got two, it would sure be helpful if you had three. And after you had three, you know, so it never stopped. Now television stations have dozens of tape machines because it takes that to operate efficiently. Now, very, very first video tape machine, do you have a vague idea of what those things were costing in those days? That's a good question, and I don't think I know. I'm going to guess twenty-five or thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which I guess was quite a bit of money in the late fifties. I'm just guessing. That may not be accurate. I don't remember the model number. It was black and white, two-inch tape, Ampex. Mm -hmm. That I recall. I recall what they look like. Now, prior to Prior to that period, though, when the uh, <coughs> videotape was introduced, uh, the K-10 was operating with a two or a three camera? Two. Two cameras. We had two cameras. And what other personnel would be active in terms of actually producing a program? Well, you'd have two cameramen. You'd have a boom operator that ran a boom mic. That was an offshoot of movies. Uh, the early days of television said don't have a microphone in the picture that's that's a no-no and so quickly thereafter there became neck mics now called more often lavalier lavaliers and uh, hand mics stand mics stick mics then then it became okay to have the announcer holding his own microphone or having a stand mic that he's saying, or have a mic on the desk when he does the news, uh, sort of like Larry King does now live, that 77D microphone sitting there, it's fake, it doesn't work. He's really got a lavalier, lavalier on, and um, that's just for decoration. <laughs> so, yeah, so you'd have boom mics, and keep the boom out of the picture, don't let that boom ever get in the picture. So you'd have a boom operator, a floor director and a director in the control room and an audio man in the control room. We weren't, in those early days, we weren't much into producers and assistant producers. And we didn't have graphics, like electronic graphics. Any graphics you had was a menu board or a camera card that one of the two cameras would shoot. And so uh, it was... Now, Commercials were, were live originally. Yeah, the commercials were either live or on film. You didn't have film commercials. So mostly the national commercials, the Pepsi's, Coke's, Fritos, Cool Cigarettes, were on film, 16 millimeter film. And you had a film projector and uh, a film chain, a projector that projected directly into a television camera, a different kind of camera, and that's how films and movies got on the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the national spots usually were on film, and the local spots were, on, uh, were done live, with some exceptions 
where some stations started getting film cameras and could make spots on film, but those were very crude and uh, very basic. So how did that operate then? You, you had, uh, let's say, a news person giving the news. Mm -hmm. We uh, had announcers and, uh, and news. We had a news staff, uh, mm -hmm. small by today's standard. One camera would be on the news person, and, yes. then, and then at the time of the commercial, the second camera would already be fixed and ready mm -hmm. to... On the other side of the studio would be an announcer. That camera would swing over and get the announcer, and he'd hold up the product, and he would either memorize his copy, which uh, the good ones did, and uh, or some would have cheat sheets or cue cards. There were, there were no teleprompters yet. Sometimes uh, the announcer would not be on. Often the spots also were 60 seconds in those days, more than 30s. And the announcer would only memorize the portion that he was on camera. And then when the camera would go off of him, like go to a card showing the front of the store or go to a card showing the price or the sale item. And uh, during the portion that he's not on camera, he he would have off camera on an easel the copy and he'd turn and read it. And then when the camera came back on him, he would look back at the camera and have it memorized or have it on a cheat sheet or a cue card. So they And then the camera would swing back to the news. And the news people read the news at that time, mm -hmm. at least on K ten? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much so. And we had stringers and we had uh, a photographer, we had a photographer that would shoot news in the area on film, this is before tape, that film would black and white, that film would go through a processor, and they did develop in the 50s film processors, uh, as I'm sure Johnny Shannon could tell you much about and Gene Allen, uh, that it would process that film fast. It, would, it could run through in minutes. You could run a uh, hundred feet of film through in uh, Oh, maybe five minutes, as I recall. Do you remember... That was fast in those days. Indeed. Yeah. Do you recall um, the kinds of sponsors that were common for K-10 for their local programming? For mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, some things would come to mind, like Hudson's Big Country Store in Colgate, uh, B.L. Owens Furniture, Ardmore Sulphur, uh, Albert's Dairy, which was out of Ardmore, uh, Wickham's Packing, Wickham's Bacon out of uh, Ada, Reeves Packing Company, uh, Potter's Sausage out of Durant, mm -hmm. brand new business, kind of grew, still around. Was the station able to gather any any feedback in terms of how effective the advertising was at that point? Well, very effective. Television was new. It was very exciting. Um, people only had two or three stations to watch. In the, in the southeastern state, once you get south of Ada, Ada could get Oklahoma City television. South of Ada, they couldn't get Oklahoma City television. They got Ada. That's mm -hmm. all they watched. No. Later, Ardmore came along. KTEN was... So when you're the only station on the air, even you had a lot of viewers. Indeed, yeah. And they were an affiliate of... They were a, a basic affiliate of ABC, but also had an arrangement with NBC and CBS. So we carried some of both. I remember we were mostly ABC. So in the late 50s, we started... That's when ABC started coming alive with... Shows like Cheyenne, Maverick, those Warner Brothers syndicated shows that they were putting up against the older skewing shows like Ed Sullivan and Jackie Gleason and Red Skelton and those shows. Those shows I'm mentioning like 77 Sunset Strip. Think of that show then like we thought of Miami Vice uh, three or four years ago. Very trendy and young skewing and so ABC uh, came on pretty good and I remember when they put Maverick on opposite Ed Sullivan and Steve Allen on Sunday night and it won and that was a big victory for ABC because they didn't have the station lineup that the powerful CBS and NBC had. 
So we were mainly ABC, but I remember we always had the World Series from NBC. And we always had uh, some football games from CBS and a few other things. So we had, uh, NBC always had the specials and the spectaculars, as they call them then. And we'd have quite a few of those. But mainly uh, Channel 10 was ABC. Now, by the time you left college, what was your responsibility at the station? I, at the time I graduated from college, and I was 21 years old, um, I was program director. And that meant I was also doing the traffic, the logs, working with Mr. Hoover on the programs and the local mu movies. And so I had kind of gone up through the ranks through college and uh, had uh, gotten to do some wonderful things at that television station because uh, at that time there were a lot of people that worked at the station that worked there because it was a job. I loved television. I knew that's what I was going to do. A lot of people I worked with were working through college or there in town and it was just a job. They weren't planning on a television career. And so I was a little different as I recall. Most people I worked with were not planning on going onward and upward into some other television operation. There were a few of us interested. Some of the engineering people wanted to stay in television, loved electronics. But a lot of the guys were just trying to graduate from college and go on and be teachers or other things. So not all of us that worked at that station were planning television careers. So I was ready. Uh, I was ready to do some things, so when I graduated, it was also about the time they built the Berlin Wall and the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was 21 and single, and uh, so I called the draft board to see uh, what's the deal, what are, what are the, what does it look like, because they were starting to draft people, and she said, well, let me check the, your uh, situation here, and she looked me up in the file. She said, well, let me put it this way. Uh, you'll be asked to go to a physical in September, and in November you'll be drafted. Next question. So I said, okay. Well, I didn't want that. I had some plans, so I joined the Army Reserve to avoid being drafted and uh, signed up for six years of Army Reserve duty, and uh, which involved uh, six or seven months of active duty, and that was more appealing to me at the time because I really didn't want the television career to stop. So uh, around that period, uh, I served the United States Army Reserve, we spent uh, seven months in Fort Chaffee, stayed in touch with uh, television stations and Hoover, and I was interested in coming to KOCO in Oklahoma City. It was in the process of moving from Enid to Oklahoma City, and they'd gotten about halfway. In that sense, I mean, there was a little uh, studio in Enid, and there was a pretty big stu studio in uh, <coughs> Oklahoma City, and the tower was in Crescent. But they wanted that tower to be in Oklahoma City so that it, it would have parity with four and nine, because um, the signal just wasn't as strong. On top of that, ABC was still the third network and growing, and uh, KOCO did not have the news operation or the large operations that the other two. So they were clearly the third station, but with a strong future. And I kind of decided that's the one I want to be with because I, and I did that by choice. I thought, well, a lot of the pros are at four and nine and it'll be harder for me to fit in and I'd rather go with a new upcoming. So I focused on KOCO. And stayed in touch with them while I was in the Army active duty. When I got out of that, I, uh, there was an opportunity to come to KOCO Channel 5, and that was in 1962. <coughs> and I, in a way, I was a college graduate, had my reserve, joined a reserve unit, 4,003rd Garrison Unit, Oklahoma City moved to Oklahoma City and sort of started over. And I started on the stage crew, running camera, doing lighting, sort of like I did seven years before. 
but that was the way to do it. I, I, there was no opportunity to move in at a higher level at that time, even though I'd done it in a small market, but it gave me a strong background. So I, in a way, started over, but I quickly moved up at Channel 5 to director, producer, and operations director, eventually becoming program manager. Now what programs early on did you direct there at Channel 5? Yes. Well, the ones that stand out, there were some specials. Uh, I remember the first show I directed, which was called The Surrey Singers, and it was with the uh, kids at OCU, and they'd just been on a South Pacific tour, and some very talented people in that group that later went on and had careers in Broadway and opera. And uh, that was the first show I directed. It was still black and white. It was uh, the uh, probably the spring of 63 was probably about the time that happened. And it was a half hour special music. And uh, <clears throat> I had a minor in music and I have a background in music. So I've uh, favored uh, uh, doing music specials, even though I've done a lot of sports. I did that, and uh, then we had uh, country music shows every week, um, sponsored by Davis and Iron Furniture and Garrett Furniture. We had at one time two country music shows every week at, at uh, Channel 5. I directed one of them each week. The um, name of it was Western Roundup, Davis and Iron Furniture. Then, uh, of course, there were the Ida B show was on every day. Uh, she had a show called Dateline Hollywood, where she uh, introduced a movie every morning and then had uh, interviews with local people and Hollywood-related interviews that she had done on film on junkets that followed the movie. There was that in there. And then probably my most fond memory is directing and developing a show called Lunch with Ho-Ho. Ho-Ho the Clown was a station personality. He had been there before I came. He was first on in the afternoon, every afternoon, with Ho-Ho's Popeye Circus, mainly doing local bits and commercials in and around Popeye cartoons, Bugs Bunny cartoons. The same cartoons you see today on TNT and WTBS. Some <laughs> things never change. <laughs> So we developed Lunch with Ho-Ho. At that time, remember, there were just four stations in the market. There were 4, 5, 9, and 13. And um, 4, 9 had newscasts. And so we counter-programmed. And we put kids on over the noon hour. and had high ratings. I had about 40,000 homes watching. The uh, college kids would go home, or not go home, would go back on, on their lunch break and watch Lunch with Ho-Ho. Because we had some inside jokes. Uh, Bill Howard was Pokey the Puppet. It was also Hollywood Harry. We had cartoons. We had live segments. We did music uh, parodies and uh, lip syncing to popular songs and uh, oh, stories. We did not have kids on the show. This was the noon hour. This was during school. We did uh, features like Ho Ho's Football Scoreboard, the B O R E D. And uh, we'd have people call in with their football predictions. And, uh, we did a kind of a mixture. That's when Captain Kangaroo was in his peak. It was also when Steve Allen was very popular. Think of Steve Allen like you think of David Letterman today. And so we kind of did a mixture of Captain Kangaroo and Steve Allen kind of humor with the emphasis more on Captain Kangaroo probably. But the people enjoyed our inside jokes, and there was a little bit of adult humor. We also had Rocky and Bullwinkle. And those shows have uh, uh, adult overtones and that humor and those cartoons. So we were appealing to a broad base there, and, and that show really sticks out. And I'm very fond of thinking of it and uh, working with Ed Birchall, Ho Ho Clown lunch with Ho-Ho. So those were, that was mid-60s, I guess, and so that's what I directed. Now, he, speaking of, of the Ho-Ho show, was his, his concept was that in general? Ho-Ho? Did it? Or lunch with Ho-Ho? Well, lunch with Ho-Ho, did that evolve from that, the, the cartoon? Yeah, that evolved. Ho-Ho was there, I think he came there in 59 or 60, 
and uh, I believe uh, the station manager then Charlie Keys, who preceded Ben West. I think Charlie brought Ho Ho over from Amarillo, and uh, and then uh, Charlie left. Ben came in, and I worked for Ben, and uh, so Ho Ho was there. He was station full time fixture and full time employee. And so it, it sort of evolved. And after lunch with Ho Ho, your programming changed, or we started doing a newscast or whatever. And then uh, we moved Ho Ho to mid morning, and the show became Ho Ho's Brunch Bunch. And then uh, years evolved, and he ended up in the morning every day, early in the morning. And that's how things changed with kids' programming as soap operas became more popular and game shows and the network schedules grew. When we were doing lunch with Ho-Ho in the mid-60s, I don't think ABC was programming anything over the noon hour. They went to black. They had a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon. <coughs> now, what was Bill Howard's responsibility in terms of the Bill Howard was stage manager. He was part of the production department. He was stage manager over there for all those years from 59 till his recent uh, leaving Channel 5, uh, you know, just recently and joining us as he did last month. I don't know if you want that, but he's here now. And uh, he's really doing a great job for us. And uh, so he was stage manager. He was involved in all that, but he also became Pokey the Puppet. And, that for years. And then later, and others can tell you about Ho Ho in the later years, but then he basically ended up in the 70s and 80s with a show once a week on the Saturday or Sunday morning, mostly Saturday morning. And, uh, and that's a tough deal there to have that kind of a show opposite the network cartoons, the Smurfs and the Pee Wee Herman's and those popular shows, that's a tough thing for a local show to compete with. And the uh, kids show needs to be isolated where uh, there's other kind of programming to choose from, but for the kids that's the main program. You put it opposite too many, uh, the local shows like that can't survive. They don't have the budgets, the action, the pizzazz to keep the kids' attention. Also children have changed through those years, and that's just the way it is. But he was a very effective uh, television personality and lasted longer than anybody. Now, who was the, uh, the air. who was the, the general manager of KOCO when you began there? Ben West. Ben West. I came in 62, I believe Ben was there in 60, 61, and, that, and Ben was manager there until 19, uh, 69, and then that's when the ownership of Channel 5, which was local ownership, you know, stockholders like Dean McGee, um, Robert S. Kerr, um, John Kirkpatrick, Boyd Benefield, Judd Bohannon, Superior feeds, I can't say his name. Lebanese. Several ownerships split politically, but uh, they sold um, the station for about eight and a half million dollars to Combined Communications Corporation out of Phoenix, Arizona. A corporation uh, based out of Phoenix that later was absorbed and purchased by Gannett. Now, at so, the time that Combined Communications took over KOCO, did they make any personnel changes of substance? They made uh, a management change and made uh, the national sales manager, J.B. Chase, manager in 69, uh, 70, whatever that year was, 69 slash 70, and J.B. Chase was named manager, and he was in that position under Combined Communications for one year. And one year later, they made a change again and replaced J.B. Chase with a, a young man from Phoenix, Arizona, with their station out there by the name of Art Glenn. And 
and that was in 70, 71, about 1971. And that's when I decided to make a move to uh, Channel 4. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was because over the last couple of years, starting in 1969, the Oklahoma City Association of Broadcasters, sort of under the leadership of Lee Allen Smith, who was manager of WKY Radio, he developed a project called the Stars and Stripes Show. And the initial concept was that all the stations, being four, five, and nine, uh, all the commercial stations would get together and be involved in producing a patriotic show, sort of in response to the negative uh, feelings uh, as a result of the Vietnam War, and that this would be a flag-waving, patriotic, positive show, singing and speeches, as, as you know about the show, and it went from 1969 to 1976. Well, in 69, while I was at Channel 5, even though most of the production effort and the equipment was at Channel 4, because that's the station that had the most equipment, most personnel, and most expertise at doing that kind of a production, they asked me to direct the show. So I became associated on that project with the Channel 4 personnel primarily. That's how I kind of got to know them and decided then that that was a little better deal and there was a little more challenges and opportunities over there. So I didn't really care for the direction that Channel 4 was taking at that time and went knocking on Channel 4's door and they made a place for me as assistant program manager of Channel 4. So I went from program director of Channel 5 in 1971 to assistant program manager under Joe Jerkins at WKY TV, which was then owned by Opupco, Oklahoma Pus Producing Company. E.K. Gaylord was alive then. So that's how that happened. And so, what, what was your responsibility at WKY when you first began the thing? Well, I was involved in uh, <clears throat> program planning and, and special productions, and they had uh, this brand new large mobile unit that could go out and do uh, major productions out in the field, big 40-foot van. So I was sort of in charge of that, so I booked that facility for outside producers, for ourselves, for commercials, for networks. That van would uh, travel all over America, to sports events for NBC, ABC, CBS, football games, basketball games, golf tournaments, and that went on uh, very heavily for about 10 years. That <clears throat> van was very busy in the 70s and early 80s doing that kind of work. <coughs> So that was a big part of it, and still, every year, doing the Stars and Stripes shows. Uh, everything was sort of stopped. Those were major productions, and each year got bigger and better, and, uh, culminating with the Bicentennial in 1976, when we did a two-hour production. And of course, uh, talent from Hollywood would come in, like Bob Hope and uh, Tennessee Ernie Ford, and The Fifth Dimension, and Les Brown's band, Nita Bryant and Dionne Warwick and Char Charlie Pride, lots of uh, talent that was uh, musical variety talent, Doc Severance, people like that. <coughs> so those were real experiences and that ended in 76. We quit doing that show because it got too expensive and um, the last five years, those shows aired on NBC nationally. So uh, that was my first national credit. And uh, of course, those originated from the State Fairgrounds Arena. And, and when they built the Myriad, the last five or six years originated from the Myriad in downtown Oklahoma City. Now, when you were at WKY, were you, you were there during the period that. Uh, uh, that the original owners 
were required to yeah. sell the window. Yes, I went through three ownerships there. And uh, the way I uh, understand that situation, it was about 1974-75, there started to be a great amount of pressure put on the multiple ownership of newspaper, radio station, television stations being owned by the same owners. At that time, the feeling was it would be perfect if there were hundreds of radio stations owned by hundreds of different people and hundreds of newspapers across America, that every newspaper, radio, and television station would have a separate ownership, so there wouldn't be no power or control, things like that. That was the feeling. So there was a feeling that um, Oklahoma Publishing Company might be forced to sell either a radio or television station, and they were not going to allow a newspaper to own a radio and television station in the same market. They could only own one. So they were afraid they were going to be forced to sell that, and if they were to be done, if that were to be done, then they would have a distressed price, not get the price they want. So they decided to beat the uh, government justice system to the punch and sell it under their own terms and get a better price for it, which is uh, probably what they did in that sense. So they sold, they tried to find a similar owner, and so they found a newspaper privately owned group out of Detroit, the Detroit Evening News Association that had the evening paper there and uh, privately owned, and so they sold the television station in 1975 to the Detroit Evening News Association, and they took it over in January of 76. Now, because of the FCC rules and regulations, the television station was forced to change its call letters. They could no longer use WKY-TV because there was a WKY radio. So they, uh, we were in the, we had to come up with a new name, and we came up with KTVY, which was uh, as close as we could get to WKY. And uh, it was a tough thing to do because WKY was a household call letter and very well known, and have to change your name. Uh, was confusing to the viewer, so that was a tough thing to do, but we did it, and uh, since then they changed it again. But <clears throat> um, during the period when they were considering selling the station, do you recall any discussion among any of the station personnel or, or anyone else for that matter about why the uh, television station was selected instead of the radio station? I think the clear-cut explanation at the time was that at the time the radio station was more profitable. Uh, the radio station was top 40, it was riding the crest of enormous ratings, there were only about eight or nine stations in the market then. They were totally dominant, and that was the, with uh, Danny Williams in the morning, and Ronnie Kay in the afternoon, and playing all the top 40 Beatles tunes and all those things. Nobody could touch them. They had an outstanding news operation, radio news cast. And uh, that was always the explanation I was given, that the radio station was highly profitable. Things changed later. They probably, uh, probably later they wished they'd kept the television station, sold the radio station. But at the time, it wasn't the thing for them to do. And uh, I think, uh, of course, the television station was larger money, and they sold it to the Evening News Association for $22.5 million, which was a big, big price in those days. And it was probably a good move for Opubco corporately because they took that $22.5 million and bought two television stations with it, one in Cleveland, Lorraine, Ohio, and another one in New Orleans, Louisiana. So corporately, it was probably a good move emotionally selling your backyard television station, your flagship, was probably tough even for Edward Gaylord to do. And Mr. Gaylord, E.K. Gaylord, uh, had died 
a year or two before. He died in 73 or 74. And this was 75 when the decision was made to sell. The product. procedure started in 76 in January is when it became effective. And then that went on through those years. But in those days, and through the, you know, uh, we could talk about Channel 4 in the 50s and 60s before I got there, and we could talk about all those shows, and others can talk to you about that, and I'd be glad to talk to them from my own memory and watching them. But then after I got over there in the 70s, we were still doing shows like The Scene with Ronnie Kay. There was uh, Danny's Day that was on every day, Wallace Wildlife, and Miss Fran, many of the shows that then stayed on for quite some time over there. And then along the way, we did a lot of other things, like the OU Coaches show was always done there, and OU Football Playback was always a big part. And then in 1980, I was very uh, involved and instrumental in bringing uh, to the station PM Magazine, a show that was a major production and it required uh, a staff of six or seven people, uh, new equipment, uh, Monday through Friday, 6.30 p.m., a mixture of local and national segments in that it was a cooperative with Group W Productions. And in its peak, there were 120 stations across America that produced PM Magazine, which each, with each station have its own local co-hosts, own local stories, and then those stories were interchanged with other cities. And it was a very simple concept that worked, brought on really by technology, the mini cam. All of a sudden you could put a television camera on your shoulder and walk around with it and get beautiful pictures with it. And I think PM Magazine was created out of that. It started with a local station Group W station KPIX in San Francisco in 1976, and uh, then it grew from there, and PM Magazine officially came to an end last week, December of 1990. They stopped doing the show. So it had a 14, 15-year run from its very beginning. And now, PM Magazine, however, had been stopped in, in yes, the Oklahoma City. Yes, City. Market. We didn't start it until 1980, and it ran until 1987 mm -hmm. here in Oklahoma City. And uh, there, last month, there were about 20 stations left doing it, so it had fallen down that. It was a unique concept, very simple in many ways. But it was a concept that needed a full support of a station. It was much easier for a station to go by Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy or Let's Make a Deal or Name That Tune and load it up on your machine every night. That was a lot simpler and less costly than hiring six or seven people trying to do some quality television or, um, you know, those kind of things. So uh, I felt very good about that project through its run. At, what after PM Magazine, uh, what other projects were you involved in at WK or I should say KTVY? Yeah. Well, as I stayed there, and um, in 1978, we lost our general manager, Norman Bagwell, who died. He'd been manager there for several years, and he was replaced by Lee Allen Smith who during the change of ownership had left the television station and had left WKY, WKY TV to go down the street a little bit and build a new WKY radio. So he had left the television operation and stayed with Oklahoma Publishing Company. Then when Norman Bagwell died, he was hired to be the new general manager in 1978 of Channel 4. So he came back in the building as manager. So uh, during that time, we uh, started, you know, doing some new things, did lots of specials. And we followed the revival of You're Doing Fine, o uh, of, uh, the play Oklahoma, and did a special called You're Doing a Fine Oklahoma. 
and, and that show won some awards, and we followed that show around the country. And, uh, it was hosted uh, by Danny Williams, Mary Hart, and Carrie Robertson. Uh, the Danny's Day Show, let me tell you a little bit about that. That show started, and uh, he took over the show, which was a noon hour local talk variety, from Tom Paxton, who was the individual there, the personality. When Tom left, Danny came, uh, he was doing nothing but radio then. He had, he had had a television career as a ch children's personality in the 50s, 3D Danny. That show went off in 57. WKY Radio changed its format from the old network type good music station, news and dramas, to the top 40 rock and roll station. Danny became the morning DJ and was a big part in making that uh, radio station so hot. He left television with the exception of maybe doing Saturday Night Wrestling. He still did that, watch out for flying chairs, which is out <laughs> cute. And um, so he kind of left television, and then 66 came back to it, still did the morning show, and then did the noon talk show. And that he carried that through the years, and that show either ran from 12.25 to 1 o'clock, 35 minutes, or then it ran 11.30 to noon preceding the noon newscast. In 73 or 4, we decided, and this was after I was over there, the thing to do would be to get Danny a co-host. It'd be nice if he had a female on the show with him, because that was kind of the thing that was happening in the business. The newscasts were starting to have co-anchors, and, and females were becoming more important on uh, the television. So we found a did some auditions and found a female co-host, and her name was Linda Scott. Her name was really Linda Kepfjen, and we thought Kepfjen didn't work real well, and so we uh, came up with Linda Scott. We almost called her Linda K, but someone said, well, they'll think she's associated with Ronnie K, and we're in the same building, they'll get confused, because her middle name was K, and she kind of wanted to go by Linda K. Linda Scott became her name. She did a good job and was Danny's first co-host. Then she left in 1976. <coughs> and just about the time she left, I'd gotten a letter from a girl by the name of Mary Hart who said she, her husband was being transferred to Oklahoma City and she'd be interested in doing work and she'd been Miss South Dakota and Miss America pageant starting to do television in Cedar Rapids. So I said, well, when you get to town, come by and uh, see me, and we'll see what's happening. We don't have any openings right now. We'll make a long story short, Mary Hart became the second host, co-host with Danny, and she was there from May of 76 to September of 79. In 79 of September, Mary uh, decided to try her uh, career in Hollywood and go out there and uh, of course people kind of know the rest of that story. She's done real well out there with the entertainment tonight. Now. She's been out there now 11 years. In 79 I replaced Mary uh, with Carrie Robertson who had been a school teacher for 10 years, had dabbled in television, had mainly done musical theater like at Lyric Theater, was very talented had done occasional commercials, but really hadn't done too much. And I hired her to be Danny's third co-host, and she was co-host until the show ended, which was February of 1984. So Danny's day came to an end in February of 84. So that was a fairly long run. You even in this market, yeah. which had a number of long yeah. runs. I remember his last rating, I always tell people this, his, the last rating book, uh, he had an eight rating. And today, I think uh, daytime shows would kill for an eight rating. Shows in the morning, noon hour area. So um, at the he, he went off a winner. At the height of, of his popularity in terms of ratings, what would you recall an approximate number? 
No, I know in the 50s when he did 3D Daddy, that was a very dominant, uh, you know, I'm sure 50 plus shares, but that was a two and a half station market then, and, uh, and uh, Channel 4 is extremely strong, and, uh, and the show was very popular. Those local television personalities in the 50s and 60s, especially 50s, uh, you know, they would be, even though not everyone owned a television in the 50s, but uh, they would, you know, stop traffic. They'd go into a store and people would really treat them pretty much like you'd think they'd treat a Hollywood star today because television was new and they were on the screen and uh, these people would, uh, were larger than life. So uh, some of that has worn off over the years with uh, uh, some of the magic is gone. There's so many talk shows now and there's not a lot of secrets and uh, everybody kind of knows how it works. But uh, Now when did you begin with OETA? Okay, so I began with OETA like uh, <clears throat> almost three years ago this week. It was in January of 88. And I came to OETA with the uh, uh, primary project at first of Oklahoma Passage, the mm -hmm. five-hour miniseries. It was uh, being planned, it had been financed, uh, the director had been hired, the writer had been hired, and two or three people were on board, but they had been here about three months, and uh, I came aboard at that time. Then we had to develop a plan of shooting, casting, getting the scripts completed because we had a deadline that April of uh, 1989 was when it was going to run. So we had almost a year and a half to get all that accomplished. And then we worked right up until April of 89 getting it done by completing five full hours. So it was a a great adventure and a very rewarding project and probably the best thing OETA has ever done. We want to do more like them and do other historical dramas and uh, about our state. <coughs> and uh, so we're developing uh, uh, the home cassette version now. Here's the packaging. It's completed and we're going to send the tapes to Van Nuys, California next week and get our home video libraries and schools version of Oklahoma Passage for, so people can have it in their home and can have it in the schools to use for educational purposes. So uh, now, in a way you, the project's still going on from that standpoint. Understood. Now would you say that you were well prepared in terms of uh, having a multiple installment documentary drama uh, from your past experience in television? Well, to a point. Uh, most of my background had been uh, doing music shows and sports and local talk shows, and I had not done a film. I had not done a movie movie. And so in this sense, it was a new adventure, a new terminology, a uh, new way of doing things, different kinds of people. But uh, part of my job was to put the creative team together bring the specialists together, the lighting, the gaffer, the uh, sound expert, the director, the photographer, the people that know those areas. And that's what it all is, is bringing those experts together, the actors, actresses, and then bring them together in a collaborative manner to make a film. And that's what it's all about. And that's the role of the executive producer. So that's... Uh, that's what I did, and I really enjoyed that. Now, the, your early television experience was one of uh, immediate uh, consequences in terms of your efforts. You were able to determine how it turned out pretty well on the spot. I would assume you felt that way. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. And so this really is the opposite end, is it not, of, uh, of that kind of ex experience? Of, having to be patient and wait it out nearly a year and so forth. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's slower in that sense, yeah. Um, ideally, you know, what I'd like to do are, are two-hour features that maybe uh, 
the script would be developed in a matter of a few months. The shooting could be completed in a matter of two months. By that I mean a five or six week shoot over two month period. Then post production, two or three months. And uh, so that's not quite as stretched out and as long. I can envision a two hour feature being done that length of time, so I'd like to do something like that, as opposed to the year and a half, and it was really longer than that when you go back to the beginning when Bob Allen began the fundraising and had the concept of this whole thing, it would go over a two and a half year period. So yeah, that, that's pretty stretched out. Well, I know OETA has a slightly different approach to news, since it is a full statewide uh, network, uh, but how would you compare not just OETA but contemporary local news and the kind of news programs you saw in the early 50s when you were beginning in TV? Well, news uh, has changed a great deal. This, is, this market has always had a terrific reputation for having quality newscasts with a lot of quality uh, journalists coming out of here and going on to bigger and better things. And so uh, those standards were set by Channel 4 for others to follow, and that's what happened, and that's what they've done very well, uh, specifically 5 and 9. And uh, now they've all got parity, and they all have large news staffs, and they all do a good job at what they do. What has happened now is uh, those newscasts have become the absolute most important profit center for those organizations. And the tough economy and the changing world of television, no longer are there three or four stations. There are now probably about 36 to choose from. So their audiences have been fragmented and uh, the uh, economic conditions have made it tough to put the emphasis on we've got to be successful in news because that's where the profits are made. So now so many things that happen within news are driven by marketing and promotion concepts more so than driven by providing information and uh, good service to the viewer. Deregulation plays a part in this. No longer is that pressure on where you had to keep your skirts clean and keep your values high because uh, you had to have a certain percentage of news and public service programming for government reasons and for licensing purposes. All that pressure's off. So now uh, there's uh, more freedom to do what you want to do. And so they're driven more by the marketing and promotion of it all. So you see more emphasis on the cosmetics, on the personalities, on the gimmicks, on the uh, uh, way that they can be involved in their community through the newscast. Not so much through the station, but in a way that can bolster and keep alive the ratings of news so that they can continue to sell spots within the news because that's where they make their profit. That's how they stay in business. So it's now, it is the most important part of their operation, most specifically the 10 o'clock news as compared to the other time periods throughout the day and weekend. Would you say quality of content is better today than it may, than it may have been? I would say today. quality of content is not as good. As in the 50s. As in the past. 50s, it was just beginning, so I'm not going to compare it to the 50s. Mm -hmm. no, it, it started developing better in the 60s, and then the news uh, cast really developed in the 70s. So, no, it's not as good as a, a decade or two decades ago, I think, in terms of content and providing uh, service and information uh, to the people. Uh, legislative coverage, state coverage, that's what helped us create over here. That's where our focus is. 
we can do more in depth. We're not in competition with those other newscasts. They're our colleagues. We exchange stories. They, we, are, we run some of their stories on our newscast. And we assist them with legislative coverage and our connection to Tulsa. We, they come over and use our facilities to uh, deliver stories back and forth to Tulsa. So we have a good relationship there, and that will continue. But in our news, we, we've been able to, uh, first of all, the 10 o'clock news, there's about 11 minutes of news on a commercial news station at 10 o'clock night. There's so many commercials, there's the weather, and there's the sports. And then they have to get off at 10.30 and go to the next show. And they've also got about 10 or 11 minutes of commercials to get in between the 10 o'clock break and the 10.30 break. So on our newscast now, we don't run commercials, and we have probably about 25 minutes of content in our newscast at 6.30, and maybe about three minutes of weather, and that's that's what that's all about. We do run one break uh, inside the show with promos, but so, so that that's the difference there. We're probably doing twice as much time, so our stories can be longer. We don't have to do 25 second stories with six second sound bites. We can do longer stories. We have live legislative coverage, and so our focus is on the state capitol and what's going on out there. And the focus of the commercial television station is not there. They often don't even have reporters there anymore. They don't even have a crew there covering unless the Speaker of the House is resigning or unless we're inaugurating a governor. And that's the, that's the way that is. So uh, this has all worked out in that we can serve that interest. And then the commercial stations can go do other things that they want to do because they are choosing to not have that kind of service. And you can ask them as to why they don't want to. But uh, maybe they want to do things that are a little more visually interesting, that are not, that don't require as much analysis and length of reporting, and they can do uh, quicker stories, more crime stories, more stories that are maybe top of mind interest. But uh, there's a lot going out there at the state capitol that affects the lives of Oklahomans. And that needs to be uh, covered. And I think we're doing a pretty good job of that. Well, I appreciate your help in this project on history of television for Central Oklahoma on behalf of the Oklahoma Historical Society. I want to express that formally. Okay, appreciate it. I enjoyed it. And, uh, it's just one of my favorite subjects, Oklahoma television. Well, this concludes our interview, and the time is 3.23.